Hello and welcome. I'm Susan Dunlop and this is Coffee and Contemplation with Women. This is episode 19 and I thank you for joining me today. The podcast series began early in February 2020 and now that we're nearly at our 20th episode, uh, I've had quite a variety of women from all over the place, from Australia, from the US, Canada, Russia. And this week's episode is from our own town. So I'm very soon going to introduce our guest and uh, she's in between meetings. So I'll hop on and get the introduction done and then we'll just move on from there. So if you don't know, the podcast has been a series of women who share their stories. They're women from every decade of life. And I think the point of that is for women to share stories as in the old ways of a village or in generational um, closeness where people actually used to get to hear stories of their elders a lot more or now even you know with the changes that are happening you know year by year for elders to be able to understand what's happening from a, a 10 year old to 19 year old's perspective uh, the point is to actually you know come up with some old memories that might bring a smile or help you reminisce as well and otherwise you might have also experienced something that one of these women have experienced. I did start the idea of it being a coffee and contemplation with women. I know many men are listening to the podcast and in particular one man has made a massive change um, to the way he was um, dealing with his daughter's education that he was driving the way it was going to go and then he listened to one show early on and he realized that it was him as well doing the same thing as that girl's father had done. So, you know, I love the fact that there's been one big change just from, you know, in one family. So that's pretty cool. As I said, I'm a life coach. I coach people now, like women mostly, but I coach um, people in all areas of their life. And they might come with a specific goal in mind. I don't have that very often, though. I have a lot of people who come to really get to understand themselves better first or you know, they're in a funk or they're needing change or they want to take their business to the next level. But most of the people that I align with in the coaching, they get that there's that deeper work that needs to be done first, that you know, they need to sort of understand who they are and express that in the world. And that's where the success will come from. And that's what you call, and you may have heard, is being authentic. And you know, it's a term that may get thrown around a lot. You, you've probably seen it come up on social media about being authentic, uh, but it might not be completely understood. And sometimes it even annoys people to hear the word authentic being thrown around too often. Having a clear sense of your core values um, and your gifts and talents, because we all have many gifts and talents and often don't even realise that, and what your purpose is, it just makes it that much easier to get a sense of your priorities. So that's where coaching usually begins rather than the goals getting smashed out without any thought of those core elements or what I call soul drivers. And, you know, knowing those soul drivers is such a valuable guide through difficult experiences and just tough decisions. You may intuitively draw on your values even and not realise that that's actually what's guiding you towards an action or to actually choose to say no. Um, but they're such a, an in, integral part of how um, we live. And as also, they're not something that we're taught as we're children. You, know, you may have them as morals or you know, loosely um, shaped from, you know, even just you know, conversations or books you read with, with your parents when you're young. But it's not something that's part of schooling, I wouldn't say, or it wasn't when I was at school. But to ch achieve success in life, that's not egotistical success, not about having to wear the Superman cape or the Superwoman cape and look at me, look at me, look at me. But real success with fulfillment, we need to feel congruent. And being congruent is when your actions align with your values and your purpose or who we are. I'd like to now introduce today's guest. Today's guest is Sandy Bolton, who is the Independent State Member for Noosa in Queensland, Australia. Uh, Sandy is talking to me today from her parliamentary office and she's just shown me a brief little view out her window. Uh, welcome, Sandy, and thank you so much for giving us 30 minutes of your time between meetings today. Susan, it's just such a pleasure and how wonderful. I'm, I'm loving the landscape behind you. Probably oh, yes. a lot more 
a lot more attractive than mine, you know. You didn't see the rest of my office that's stacked high with bills everywhere. Oh, no, no, no not my type of office. No. <laughs> this one, the one behind me is actually from the local artist, Julia Carter. Uh, it's called I the... know, I know Julia, love Julia. I'm so sad that I'm not in my office at Noosa because I have the incredible works of Jandamara Cad. Oh, do you? I know Jandamara too, so yeah. Okay. Well, this is um, apparently the flowers of Timbiwa behind me. It was one of her first pieces she ever did. Stunning. Love yeah. it. Now, Sandy, I asked you to come on as a guest today, um, just from the few chats we've had and from following your, you know, very keep it to the important facts, thankfully, Facebook feed um, since COVID-19 began. <laughs> it was really clear to me that you are a leader, um, not just a woman leader, but a leader of our community and really in tune and reverent to your values, your gifts and your purpose. Um, I work a lot with that in terms of coaching. So that's what's made you stand out to me just as a, a woman I'd like to actually have come and share your story today. So I was thinking maybe we could start in that area of your life first and then we can talk about some other things. What do you think? How, about, how far do you want to go back? <laughs> do you want to delve into my childhood? <laughs> Well, there was that question that I noticed that you don't want to answer was the, what's the question you have never been asked that you don't want to be asked? So I'll leave that oh, one I'm there. Having, <laughs> I'm, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to answer that later and I think Ooh. you'd be quite surprised. <laughs> well, that sounds good. Okay, all right. I'll hold you to that one. So just in terms of, you know, your, your experience, sorry, were you, um, are, are you born and bred from the Noosa area? Oh, no, no. And look, I... I have a really diverse history and I think it it has really contributed to who I am today. And, um, you know, my mother, an amazing woman in, in an era that there was no welfare. She was way ahead of her time, a, a real Trojan, a workhorse, um, businesswoman. And uh, when Dad left, um, there was, of course, four of us. And it, it, that, in that... In, those times were tough. It wasn't uh, like it is now where, you know, you have enormous assistance. And so uh, back then it was a church. So we managed to, uh, they really helped out. So a bit of a shed without running water. And Gosh. what I learned early, I suppose very early, is that I always saw, um, regardless of anything, effort is needed to achieve. So, and there was no, I didn't have any boundaries in terms of a delegation of roles. It was just, if the job needed doing, and I, I remember watching my mother and I didn't understand it at the time that that wasn't a normal household where mum would go out to work and she would do whatever it took, whether it was painting houses or um, running businesses for other people and that she'd get in overnight and, you know, if the drain was blocked, she'd fix the drain and she'd be out there digging trenches. And so there was no delegation. We all just had to get in. And I was very much the youngest. I mean, by the time I was four or five, everyone else had left. So I think that it, it, in a way that was a really positive though some people have said to me oh my goodness we've, we've you know heard about your growing up and oh how really hard that must have been but what it gave me was a platform of if something needs doing you just get in and do it yeah. um my mother wouldn't accept any excuses there was no excuses as to you know i remember her saying to me if you're not up at the crack of dawn you're lazy so we, you know, we had to be out of, out of bed early. So that whole upbringing was one of um, that you 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 reaped what you sow in terms of your efforts. Yeah. Um, and I recognised very early that I was always trying to save everything. So where I lived, there was some in in parts of our lives was not a very nice place. Where on our road. There was always um, bags of puppies and kittens dumped. And, and it was really, for me, very traumatic. Walking to school, of course, the first thing I do is grab whatever was dumped, you know, haul home. Yeah. And so I had to go to work very early because my <laughs> mother said, well, if you want to have these pets, you have to pay for them. You have to look after them. So um, we did. So I think you know, I can remember being 
you know, eight, nine years old, digging potatoes, um, you know, on the little farm that, you know, yeah. she share farm. That. So it was always about responsibility. It was always about ensuring that if you wanted something, you looked after that, um, but looking after others. So there, I, you know, I, quite naively, I can remember being very young and, and fundraising for um, the disability sector. And, you know, thinking I was doing an amazing job, you know, I collected up anything that I had and had a little auction. Oh, <laughs> it was, gorgeous, gorgeous. It was <laughs> all, all very, very cute, but it was just about if something needed doing, you just did it. Yeah, so that was your normal. So, you know, everyone's got their own normal and that was just your normal. And you didn't see your mother being anything apart from being your mum. That's what she did. That's right. That's yeah. right. And I think when, when you have, nobody would say to me, well, that's not normal or, you know, you should be heading, heading off like normal is having, you know, family time, um, having going away on holidays, um, you know, school events and that I never had, you know, because mum was always working. There was never anyone to come. Even when I was ducks of the school, there was nobody there to go, oh, fantastic. Well done. Mm. It was, it was just a norm. So I think when you, when you grow up through that, you don't have a reference point to say that's different than any other household. No, so in that's a way, right. it, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it doesn't come in hand though when you become a parent yourself because that is a whole different kettle of fish because you only know what you know. Exactly. So, yeah. I often talk about that. Learning. Yeah, in terms of, you know, we're all amateur mums, really, when it comes down to it. Oh. We only learnt from the mum and the mum before and we're very quickly back to the 1800s before we know it. But. That's right. That's right. Uh, so I suppose in terms of where we we're talking about in terms of purpose, I would say that, that you're a very authentic and understanding person so that you get what the average person faces from just oh. that experience and you've obviously developed that, you know, the self-sufficiency, um, the self you know, reliance or um, what's the, the word for resilience we were talking about? Resilience, but I think also the empathy and, and part of that growing up, um, you know, I was I was a very round child, a very round child. Mm -hmm. And and the in I can remember really early, um, because I didn't have any sense of that that was something not to it, 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 it wasn't, um, I didn't consider being overweight an issue. And I was, I was very curious. So I used to get into a lot of trouble. I used to go wandering a lot and visiting. Uh -huh. And I was really fortunate when I was about five years old, we lived at a place called Evans Head, which would always at holiday time become full of campers. And, and my mother was very busy running her business. So I'd just head off and I'd go and visit all the, you know, people camping. I'd stop off and have lunch and see what they had oh, to eat. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then I'd head off into the bush because there was a wonderful um, colouring in and, and activities at the Lord's Boot Camp that used to come every Christmas. Oh. So I would head up there and, of course, I'd start, I'd just stay and then didn't realise everyone was out searching for me, you know. It was dark. <laughs> and so I was always in trouble. The curiosity of yeah. always wanting to go and see things and um, I think that's been part of my whole life as well. And yeah. even though I did a lot of smacks for that and I also got grounded a lot um, for that, but it was part of the curious and when meet people, talk to people. And I think it was only probably once you went to school and getting a little older that I realised that the, the hand-me-down clothes, because we still were classified very much as the poorer side of town. And, you know, mum couldn't afford a uniform and that. So it wasn't probably until I was, you know, getting in that latter part of primary school and, yeah. you know, yeah. some of the bullying and the things starts happening. But, yeah, until then I never realised that, you know, um, anything about me was just anything different. Yeah, and I do. I come across that with um, some of the younger girls I've spoken to. Where they say that you just don't realise and then suddenly it's actually other people um, are starting to point things out to you and then it just changes life from being good to having a little bit of probably a bit of you know, just disease and you know so how do you actually move through that then to be the person that you're going to be you know in, in through your teens and and then into yes. your 20s yeah yeah without it without it hugely impacting who you are or being labeled and I think the labeling and I and I suppose now that's why I speak a lot about labeling I have a huge amount of empathy um, because as I've 
lived through adulthood and a lot that I've seen. And I've been so fortunate in terms of even, you know, the time I spent in the Northern Territory on a million acres in the middle of nowhere. Um, as I've gone through my life, that empathy about the perceptions people have and the labels they attribute yep. to either. And, you know, we often, you will hear a lot of talk about inclusion and discrimination. But some of the greatest discrimination I've seen is based on what people perceive your economic worth is or oh, what category you come from. So, and, and it sticks clearly in my mind, you know, when I was young, my first fiance, um, and his mum saying, well, she's from the wrong side of the tracks and not suitable, you know. Oh, so that old chestnut. It, <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, but we still have that labelling now, but in different ways. And it's one that I really love with my work experience and my interns and my youth ambassadors is the recognition that uh, through labels, there is then a preconceived idea that's perpetrated. And a lot of the issues we're confronted with and trying to resolve is actually hampered because of that labelling. Oh, for sure. And, yeah. And it's, and it's one thing as we move through, and, and as you would know, some of the works I've done now for going on five years regarding the uh, need for affordable you know, housing. And when I first brought that conversation up five years ago, I can remember there was um, you know, some responses that said, oh my goodness, we don't want all the poor people in Humpies living everywhere. And you're going, no, you know, like affordable living should be uh, the 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 enti I'm not going to say entitlement's the wrong word. It should be accessible to all. So That's that right. the the duress and stresses that we're seeing when we're having families and and working individuals and our over fifty fives women um, coming to a time where they're paying sixty or seventy percent of their working income on their rent or mortgage means that that uh, panic every time you see the electricity bill or trying to fuel the car or thinking about what's going to happen if you lose your job is creating not only the, the stressor mentally, but physically, and is a contributor to the domestic violence increases we're seeing. It's, it, it is such a, and, and I'm loath to say it, but when you go back to Maslow, good old Maslow and the, and the hierarchy of yeah. needs, that ability to have shelter, it shouldn't come with, that huge strain and duress that's creating in so many of us um, the, the the frustrations and the anger and and sometimes the reliance on whether it's um, you know medications from the doctor to for the anxiety or some other substances exactly and I think um, I mean right now too like I mean I know you've talked about that being over five years work that you've been doing but if you're thinking in terms of what everyone's experienced since February this year and that the whole shock to our local uh, network in the hospitality industry i remember that night listening to the, the pm thinking gosh some of my daughter's friends are all just getting put out of business or losing their jobs tonight and how are they sitting there watching this on tv right now and i remember it was quite a shocking thing in our day and age that like i, I rang my daughters all of them i said are you okay with that news because i've never ever seen that happen that type of announcement and it's not normal times we're about to go through, so. No, and when you think we are already have been in crisis now for some time, this oh. is not something new, um, you know, the, for, you know, probably really solid the last three years, you know, the beautiful people of our community saying, look, we just want someone to park, somewhere to park up a tiny home or a demountable oh. as something that we can afford. Yeah. And, and everyone's um, definition of affordability is very different Yes. But I think if you simplify it, um, from a bank or a government point of view, they look at 30% of your income is, mm. is an acceptable amount to pay for your rental mortgage. Yeah. I'd love to see how many actually within our community who work in our key pillar industries, um, and I've spoken to many of them, and it's not 30%. No. That's no, much, sure. much, much higher. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, a, it's an incredible thing that our um, the, the place in which we live relies on so much um, a lower income, I think. You know, there's such disparity across the whole thing. So, 
Anyway, I won't get you caught up in that because <laughs> we've got so much to cover. We could just talk we forever. About, oh my god! We should have about ten sessions. You know, <laughs> Actually, I, do, I do say that sometimes. We do actually say, "Hey, but we have another session or something else." So I won't, I won't catch you up in next. I, as I said, I do know you have a meeting to go to later. Um, so just, well, how about we continue into that little the section that we started off with? How did you get started on your journey to your current position? What led you to this role that you're in? Look, I think, yeah, look, I thought, and going back probably 30 years ago, I, I did some advocacy on behalf of our, our First Nations women um, where I was because I saw that there was a lack of understanding from those in positions of uh, decision-making that were coming out with legislation or uh, directives or policies that were totally against what was sought uh, by these women. And I suddenly realised that there was a perception as, as from... I suppose, a, a European viewpoint um, or, or a Western viewpoint that we know better. So we should be telling everyone how they should do, whether it's to, you know, whether it's to be birthing their babies or... Yeah. And and I, I really started to understand about some of the difficulties being faced and why we have some of the, the issues. It wasn't until I moved um, and... You know, after years of driving past from, you know, drought-stricken areas, I'd always come down the highway and, and heading to Sydney to take the grandies back to see the grandparents. And there was always a green patch. And every time I'd go, oh, one day I want to come and live here. It's always green every time we drive through. And that was actually the highway through Karoi. As soon as oh. we hit that Karoi area, it was green. So, so we did. We ended up in an old... Um, uh, the original dairy farmhouse at Kinkin and it didn't have it didn't have much flooring or anything but it was 60 acres and uh, when I first came I was approached to um, I developed the Kinkin Village Voice as a part of connecting the community and um, I was first approached to go oh you know would you like to run for XYZ I won't say what, which party I said oh no I, the worst thing I can't think of anything worse than being a politician um, the <laughs> <laughs> and, um, oh, <laughs> that and, um, and so along the years and, and working not only, you know, within the private sector, but also working with our community organisations. And, and after that, I suppose, 25 years and seeing the frustrations and really not understanding why um, what I saw as really basic 101 issues weren't being addressed. And I'm not, and I think you you know me by now, I'm not the type of person to get up and start, you know, ranting and raving. And I really need to understand something first to go, all right, why? I need to, it's that curiosity, why is it so? And sometimes you can only find out the why's by actually getting in amongst it. Yeah. And, and learning the the facts versus what, it, the, what the perception is so that's how I um, put my hand up to run for council uh, was successful uh, and that was in the D amalgamation I learned so much in those <laughs> two years yes uh, busy times. Okay. It, it, well it was very busy because literally it was it was starting a council from scratch again so yeah. every single um, old policy had to be pulled back out and and it, it was an enormous part, but also it was really good because you were ha you had to fast track through so much, and um, then I missed out on the mayoralty. Um, went back and was uh, went back to the private sector and were working um, in the transition for our local disability organisation, Sunshine Butterflies, to oh, then yeah. be uh, ready to kick off under the NDIS, and um, in amongst that. Um, was approached about running for state and I said oh, yes you know because the boys when I was in council always said oh Bolton you'd be so much better in state because you're you're interested in all things that expand beyond council's role that's what I was thinking that's what you, what you said before and I think it was in um in this week on your Facebook page because you're down in parliament to um was it you, you're writing the ballot victory speech or something? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, the other night in the midnight hour, yeah. I, was, I was doing the annual valedictory, yes. And, but, but um, you were saying in it, though, that, um, that which, actually, I think I've got to hear somewhere, we're saying that to, to have an MP whose only alliance is to our community can also encompass the diverse needs of communities across Queensland. So it's, what you're saying, it's not just about Noosa, it's 
the work you do, you're, you're more expansive in how you think. Yes, and um, and I think that's it's it's really important because there is there's different levels of the work you do, and and first and foremost. Um, the you have the that stack of issues that need addressing. You know mm. whether you know when I came on board, it was you know for years and years. You know Beckman's hadn't been done, and Six Mile Bridge, and there's all those that desperately need doing. So you you get straight in, and once you've got those on track, and 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 you've got that running at a, at a certain level as to where you can't. Um, and it's always it's a lot more complex than what people think because you know and with Beckman's it's working with both council and state so mm. that what we end up with council are very happy with because ultimately they are responsible for the maintenance afterwards oh, so yeah. It, yeah. it's really important that that partnership and collaboration happens mm. so that you get the result that's right for the community yeah. um, but then there's there's the broader things that mightn't be apparent on the surface however if they aren't fixed they create the platform for issues that impact our community and it can be for example a lot of the work that I've been doing on trying to get the protected area strategy through um, ensuring that grassroots organizations um, actually get the funding because as I've worked through to see why you can see millions of dollars poured into a certain sector and but then you get with the organizations and it's not quite reaching them and and when you start to figure out why and the importance of how you can affect and make sure it does get to the organizations and it's yes. not that anything wrong is being done it's just that now through years and years obviously of um layers and how we've become quite a reactive society. So instead of the innovative society that we ask of business and of our communities, mm. government can be very cumbersome because innovation is about, you know, it's almost the uh, develop, test, refine model, whereas government's more, you've got to investigate it for five years and then take five years to develop the strategy and, and to tick every box and make sure it's perfect. But by the time you actually may get to uh, deliver that strategy, it's aged past yes. yeah. era. But it, it's, it's almost, you know, you either have to go and do it all again. or So that's where there is some changes that will not only um, benefit enormously um, Queensland, but a benefit enormously Noosa ultimately yeah. and the future generations. Okay. Well, I would just say in that respect, you're a better woman than I. So there we are. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Don't you want to come and share reading some of those, you know, and, oh. and plucking through? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, for, for I think it was about a year or two, I was on the uh, I was a director on the Sunshine Coast Economic Development Advisory Board. That was enough, and I stepped away. <laughs> <laughs> I can't stand it. I'm sure slow. I always prefer. I much always prefer though being with the people and not with the stacks of paperwork going through. And oh that's why I really, I'm really <laughs> fortunate to have. Um, you know, I think in, since I've been an MP, I've um, hosted now uh, 14 interns and, you know, youth ambassadors. So they'll come for 12 weeks and they will work on a particular part, which I've, you know, dug down to and gone, okay, we need to now look at this because this seems to be the problem right down in the, the bottom there. Yeah. And, you know, so they're able to spend their time because often their political science or law, um, you know, they're in there last year. So they're really good at going and digging. And yeah. that's how we have that successful private members motion on that 30 year issue was with the help of one of my interns doing oh, really? all the front you know, with me. Yeah, so it's, it's quite fueled by your curiosity in the beginning anyway. I think the curiosity and willingness to ask another question or a different question comes up, I think, in this is what we're talking about. I think ultimately it's to get a resolution. I, mm -hmm. and, and I understand the frustration because I get frustrated as an MP when something's yeah. so simple. You can go, uh, you know, be sent and it can take you two years to ultimately get to the point where you go, I've just spent two years and we're, yes, we've made progress, but not enough. And it's, no. it's how the system is, you know, is choked up. So, yeah, so you, you've got to loosen it up a bit. <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah. So, um, so could you tell me one common myth that makes you smile and one that makes you shake your head about the day in the life of a member of Parliament? 
I think the one that makes me smile the most is um, uh, when I meet people that go, oh, you know, you're an independent. I go, yes, the only one in Queensland. And they go, well, but independence really can't get much done. And that one makes me smile because I'm able to go, I think if you have a look at the results, you would be so surprised what an independent not only can do, but does do. Mm. And it's not just in the tangibles, um, it actually creates the an environment within chamber. And if you look at the ASPG or any of the organisations that work to create a political landscape that serves us better, it is, I suppose, the objectivity and the clarity yeah. that independence can bring to a debate because it's not based on dragging anyone down or the next election or it's not part of a broader strategy. It's just about, well, here's the facts and, and you know, and some things are really difficult. It, you can take it to your community and, and, and take all the facts and, you know, sometimes there isn't a really clear-cut, simple answer, but you, you need to sometimes move forward and renewables is just one, but don't get me started because no. everyone loves renewables and the thought <laughs> of but it brings it it brings a series of problems as well. So, <laughs> so that being said, what makes you shake your head in, about the day in a life? Oh my goodness! I I think about um, so, you know, when I when I think about all the different ones that I shake my head about, it's it's probably the misconceptions or um or the the lack of uh knowledge around sometimes even what an mp does mm. and the an mp um i i think there's sometimes the the perception that they every mp's got all these staff and and um are able to just get around and you know go to events and have a wonderful time and and it's so far from the actual reality. I mean, we love, and I love nothing more than being with my community and it is so important. Mm. But the the real work is the work that you get up and I get up at 4.30 in the morning um, and I'll go through till midnight. It, it is that intense volume of work that is um, not understood. And when... And that's what I love about having interns as they decide where they're going to go, whether they want to become an MP or they want to work within government. Mm. I think there is the show and, and the speed at which you have to work. So I think that um, that shaking of, of head moment is when there is a, um, a belief that um, it is... Um, it is a simple job and you're just elected and there you go. It's, you know, you're not really earning your keep. Um, and once someone comes and spends a couple of days, uh, it's amazing. They go, I would never, ever want that yeah. job. And the, the hourly rate is actually comes way down <laughs> what you used to earn and, and, it, oh. and it has, has, some, has some interesting, interesting parts is that oh. you can't even, you know, when you're in the private sector, you can actually claim your, your uh, dry cleaning and that, whereas an MP, you can't. So, you know, it's... it's oh, so it's the chosen it's, career. Okay. <laughs> the chosen career. So it's not quite what it seems. And it's... Um, and the other one that is a constant, and I suppose what I go out really strongly with, is when people say to me, well, what's the difference... Um, I can't, not myself, I'm talking about people in the community, that their voice or what they think or anything they do can't make a difference to anything. And the simplicity is that every time they make a decision, whether it's through their purchasing power, you know, the power of the pocket, yeah. um, every single day that one person and when that collective mass, that is actually what driving what government does. Yeah. And the tipping point is when there's a recognition that the volume is just about to expand beyond. So for every, if every single person, just the simplicity of through their purchasing power, for example, just bought local. And that was the fantastic. Uh, and I'm not saying COVID is fantastic, but we had some really good outcomes from COVID. And one was straight away within our communities the support for local businesses 
uh, straight away buy local, support local. Um, that alone, if uh, when um, I'm approached about why do we allow imports that create an uneven playing field for our own producers, as it's as simple as we just don't purchase it and and the supermarkets and that won't even hold it. They will uh, only hold it. Yeah. So we, we are enormously powerful. Yeah, and um, we did, as you said, COVID was amazing for, like, in, in my business side of things, like, I say to people, like, look at what happened that you've never even expected to have, have, have needed to have done before in your business. Like, it's not been great, no, but it's amazing how many people's minds switched and turned their businesses and dialed them up or, you know, worked out ways to work with other businesses who are in you know, competitors that they're sharing yeah. their resources. It's been incredible to watch. I love it, but, you know. I, mean, I don't love COVID nineteen, yeah. but I I love that that, scene, right, that that's spirit. Right. No one loves yeah. no one loves COVID nineteen, no, but no. Saw, and I think if you saw one of my speeches about um, if we could hold the culture that developed through the emergency, when mm. we saw levels of government collaborating together in a in a you know tr almost tripartisan oh. way, the speed at which things would, were done is what you would norm. Yeah, we would love to expect as the norm. Um, you would see a totally different landscape, and oh, to yeah. try to hold on to that is so important. And so, you know, but you know, it, it's not easy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Get, 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 hold on, hold on. So that being said, um, tell me what profession? Yeah, sorry, what profession other than the one you're in would you like to attempt? <gasps> Do you know, I, when I think about different things I've done in my life and I've, and I've loved all of them for different aspects, but over the years um, I've, I've found I get an enormous um, joy from sharing information and, and teaching, but not teaching as in, oh, here is, here is how you do something, um, but imparting um, the, the way or the knowledge for at success, uh, for example, successful advocacy, because okay. there is there is a lot of uh, misconceptions about how you get things done. And I yeah. know with my yeah. interns and those that are passionate about different things, is that there is a way to successfully get to where you want to go to. Okay. Um, the era, the era of, uh, for example, petitions and and protesting and placards and and don't get me wrong i have two aunties that were, were you know very out there with protesters and their placards and, and they nearly disowned me on a particular bill that i supported but um it's that there is um when you look at what the role is of government and government departments it is to to get solutions when you can do your homework and provide a way to deliver that solution um, that's doing part of their work for them. Yeah, so, okay. for them, as an it's, advocate, it's, then is what you're saying. So you need to be an advocate. Well, 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 as an advocate, anyone that's an advocate, um, whether it's you're a school student that wants to affect change, and I see so many of our incredible youngsters and what they do, but they're actually leading the way by demonstrating how to do it and successfully taking forward if they have. Um, a strong belief in any arena, they're ensuring that they're armed with the objective facts, not a um, something that's pervaded by a particular vested interest or, a, or an ideology or part of something that is, um, I'm not saying it's not right, but they always need the full complement of information. And sometimes that's difficult, as you know, because you will see in this era we have feeds coming in at a million hours through social media and, and the internet. So, you know, one will say that's blue and one will say, no, it's azure and, you know, you'll have every expert. Um, but it's taking, you know, working out the credible sources, mm. taking those and then really investigating yeah. and coming up with a way in which that can be resolved. Mm. And not easy and it is hard work and it's it, the era of that as i say to my aunties it's simple to to jump out for one day hold the placard and and wave it around but to invest say a year of your life and we have so many incredible people over the years whether it's to do with animal welfare or the environment that just have 
dug down, dedicated their realm, put the facts forward, put, demonstrated how it can be done. And the change they have created, they're the real change makers. Mm. And we're a new era of change makers and they have the capacity and the, the ability to do incredible things. Yeah. And they are. And yeah. it's just, and so sharing that knowledge of how things can be done um, and how they can be done, because really what our communities want to see is those collaborations and partnerships. They really don't want excuses or blame game about why their road isn't fixed or or why can't we in, in a country of plenty, why can't we have some affordable, you know, ways of living? Yeah, that's and, right. So that was it called? It's like it stop giving us all the reasons why not. How about you actually make it be something you, you can actually contribute to making happen? And, and yeah, and I think yeah. now when we come into crisis mode, it's, it's not, don't give us the reasons uh, why you can't. Yeah. Uh, you've got to give us the reasons why we must. Yes, and yeah. it, it, it's that simple. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I think that's the thing. I think, and I think even um, a lot of our youth now, I think, well, I've noticed, I suppose my own daughters are in their 20s, but I could tell that switch where they all suddenly decided, yes, they wouldn't vote. And, you know, before that, it was a lot of, oh, I'm not going to vote, don't want to be involved with it. But I can see there's been a change and there's even, um, I think I, we won't go into the, the whole, this is a topic, but I know there's the, the Black Lives Matter and um, you know, the, the protests and um, all those people gathering in Melbourne. But I know my own daughter, she was very upset about what was going on and, and she has spent a lot of time since researching to understand it all better. And I think there's a lot of yes. people going, you know what, do the right thing, find out more. And don't just be a la 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 voice. Be a be someone who matters. It makes a difference. That's right. And and, yeah. and and also that goes and experiences. And and that was the greatest gift given to me was to be able to spend all those years with our First Nations people in those communities, mm. living as they do, working alongside them, and really getting to understand that. If you're going to um, take a position or, ad or advocate, you need to go and experience it. Yes. You can't you can't pick up a newspaper and go, this is what's going on yeah. because that, that is always going to, um, it's not going to deliver the outcome that you're actually seeking either because you're coming from a flawed um, base anyway. That's right. So, yeah. Actually, it's interesting at some stage soon, I'm just waiting for it to get back to me. I've got a woman who works in um, trauma and tra with trauma survivors um, in the um, in indigenous community, not just in Australia, but all across the world. And she's working, you know, like the, with the misconception, I think is the word, that people can just get over something quickly. So it takes like oh. hundreds of years to get over what some of these generations have experienced. And their children are still obviously uh, impacted by what happened, you know. So and, that'll and, be interesting. I can't wait to have her on, but yeah, she'll be hopefully in the next month or so. And yeah. I think at some time, you know, I often talk about the, the conversations we need to have mm. and we've got to expand on those conversations because um, generation generational hardship is not just related to culture or, or, or colour. No. Um, when you look at the generational hardships of, you know, even the simplicity, you know, I look at, you know, right back um, from when my family first came across on the Selkishere in the 1800s, oh. um, you know, they, they you know, hundreds of you know, years literally of shed dwelling uh, in the hardest of conditions and all the way through to where even, you know, when I went through some hardship and my children and I lived in a six by nine shed. It's, there is a conversation about what, happens um, within us or when the expectations of and whether that is great poverty mm. and as it comes down and you, you can be um, incredibly hard working people and all all my lineage were they were farmers and, and it was really tough but with that came a lack of educational opportunities and and that expectation of of what was available to you yeah. that came right through our lineage, including with my mother, that, you know, I didn't have the option of going on at school. By the time I was 14, she said, right, you need to get out to work. So yeah. you, there is always, I think, a broader conversation because there is within everyone's heritage, there is there are things that are passed on and it's hundreds of years. Oh, for and sure. That's and that really poverty, the poverty is a massive thing. I, I, I've done a lot of... You know, research myself into that but even just seeing that with um you know even i think you know my husband's line of being you know from from glasgow i looked back at their family tree and it's like poor house poor house poor house poor house 
And so you think, well, so so fair call. You have a massive fear of, you know, having nothing. And that yes. comes down through, and I've seen it, his parents, and I've seen all his whole family have it, and, you know, and we've been affected by it. I think. So, yeah, mm-hmm. it does. It, just, yeah, it doesn't go away. You know, it needs work. Yeah. So, yeah. I think it always raises the most important thing that, and uh, that's why I love organisation like Chances and, and, and whether it's Invincible Hall or Salvation Army or any organisation that actually provides opportunity and mm. access to opportunity because that is key, even as a child, that, to be, that opportunity to be able to, you know, whether it's play sport or follow a passion or, but also not be labelled so that your, your lived experience is not one of that it's preordained mm. as if, if you've come down a lineage of hardship that means that you will have hardship as well. And yeah. I think there's a lot of work in that when you, um, you know, talk about our, our genetics, what type of genetic memory is even held in that. And I know it's not only held physically but obviously in so many ways. Yeah, and I think that's the thing. We, we know now that there is the work that can be done that's just future-focused or but at least it's a conversation that's being had more often versus, you know, generations ago wouldn't have ever been had. It was just, yeah. yes, this is what you are and this is who you are and you're going to be like us and, and be better that. than that. Yeah, yeah. that's right. I think that was the, the cat cry when I was growing up. It's like, don't hear about it, just get on with it. You know? Down it bums up. <laughs> I think my favourite saying, my favourite saying that, you know, throughout everything and, and I am like everyone else, you know, I've gone through some really tough times where you do, you throw yourself on the ground and you go, oh, you know, it just can't get any harder or tougher. Um, But it's always that thing of, it's not what happens to you, it's how you respond and how you actually look at it in terms of your growth as, as a, as a human being Mm. um, and to understand. And that's why I have a great, people often say, how do you have so much patience patience with people that are really, really awful on social media or, or are bullying you or, you know, harassing you or saying awful things. And I I think it came from that understanding from the enormous bullying I had when I was younger, Mm. that it comes from their fear. There's an element of fear as to, you know, it's so much, um, if you are frightened or deep down, have been hurt, that is a mechanism. Oh yeah. In a yeah, way sure. of, yeah. of defence. And it's and it's really understanding that. But also sometimes you have to get the wooden spoon and go, now enough's enough. That's you know <laughs> you're now you're now going over the boundary of what's acceptable in, you know. Yeah. Thank, thanks Sandy's mum, she told you that one. <laughs> 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 my children will tell you that as well but like, right, i'm so sorry okay, okay, I, think, enough, enough. <laughs> I won't take up much more of your time i'm going to ask you what one question are you grateful you've never been asked in an interview oh now can i say about one that was asked many years ago and why i'm glad that no one has asked me this one okay. i'm so glad that no one has actually ever asked me the shade of my hair Oh, the colour of my hair. Now, there's a reason because going back and I can remember, there's not many times I remember when I was very young being almost that my jaw dropping and, and speechless. You know, I'm not the type of person to be speechless really about <laughs> anything. But it was being interviewed by a television um, uh, panel when I was in, when I was 16, I think, um, at, for I was in a, a, a you know, raising funds for um, the disability sector, and you know, it was in like the Miss Australia contest or whatever, and so I was all geared up for the big interview, and I was asked, "Oh, what is the colour of your nail polish?" Oh. Now, I because not only is it the last thing I would think you would ever be asked in a million years, mm. um, but I would never even take note of what colour the name, and it's like the colour of, of a hair dye. You know? Oh, my so, God. Yeah. And so, so I'm glad no one's ever asked me because I would have to say, uh, one, I'd have to sound like all the things we never want to sound like. Um, I'll have to take that on notice. Or um, <laughs> I have to go find that out. Or I don't know because I can genuinely say I have no idea. No idea <laughs> anymore. I think that's the thing, isn't it? It's like, I don't know. I, you know, I just don't know. So, so I'm so glad no one's asked me that because I can pretty well be asked anything and I'll be able to, 
fairly well answer the question. Yeah. But that one, I would have to go, no, I'm going to have to take that on notice. I'm, I have no idea. <laughs> no, okay. And it's one of those ones where you look at that person always differently after they ask you that question, I think. <laughs> Oh, I, you know, I, I mean, really? I'm, so, I'm so glad we've come to a totally different era now um, where yes. I'm sure a question like that, we're going back many years ago. Now yes. I'm, you know, I'm almost considering my age, but we are talking about 40 years ago. Um, that at least those four decades, that the types of questions, and I, I had a big interview session with my two ambassadors the other night, and the, the content of the questions when you're talking now is 16-year-olds is vastly different and I'm sure they would have picked me up and tossed me out the door if I asked the colour of their nail polish. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. And I, don't, I don't even think they'd ask you that question on that show that you can't ask that. I don't think that would be one of the questions. But anyway. <laughs> so I've got two last questions for you. Um, what is your favourite mantra or quote that gets you by in hard times? Uh, no, it, it, I think it still would be it's, it's, it's not what happens to you, it's, it's how you respond. Mm -hmm. But I, recently, um, m more my mantra, I, I, you know, it could have come from somewhere else, I don't know, but it's one that with every single um, frustrating aspect that I might be working with, it is exactly what we were talking about before. You know, it is now time. I don't want to hear any more the reasons why we can't because on some of the issues I deal with in every realm, it's I'm given whether it's to do with planning reasons or legislation or, you know, all the reasons why we can't. It, it's now all the reasons why we must. Yes. You can only yes. go through so many decades of, of a rationale that has failed us. Yes. So yes, so that would that would be it, and that's what takes me forward. And, and and in a couple of my speeches, I've been very clear. And even this Parliament again, it is really clear. You know, if what we've been doing for thirty years, based on a rationale of, of well, why we can't do something, um, it hasn't held us in good stead. We now are in a situation we have to um, find the reasons why we must. That's yeah. what we've got to focus on and deliver those. That's it. Be part of the cause. I think you know. <laughs> <laughs> Make it happen. <laughs> um, Sandy, what song is your happy dance song? What's your favourite song oh, that you sing to oh, all the way up and down the highway? Oh, I have so many. You're asking me a question in my head full of legislation and, what, oh, and, and oh. I'm about to head into business committee, all the things that... And I have, I have such a love of so many genres of music. Um, but if I think back to... Um, those those songs that you know when when you're younger and maybe not so younger, um, but I let me think. Oh, um, look, one that I know that the girls and I always used to was uh, a song by Prince. Um, ah, yes. Let's go crazy. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, that, cool. Yes, it was a really, really, um, and I think when when I look back when we were younger. We, we probably never listened to the words. So we've always <laughs> got to be careful of, of what the words are. But I always remember it was the, it was the beat and the tempo and, you know, I love tribal music and, and okay. all of those. But it's always to do with a, a beat and a tempo that either uplifts you yep. or calms yep. you or uh, makes you a bit sad or reflective and, and different music. You know, I love James Taylor. I love, you know, grew up with 10cc and all different ones. Oh, yes, so, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> so, so, so that's it. But, you know, let's, let's go crazy. And that's just popped up. Don't know why, but it probably is, is associated with a lot, a lot of uh, happy, happy times with, as we're growing up, you know, with the girls yeah. and the girlfriends and, you know, just absolutely having all that beautiful energy. And, and I probably would still dance to it now, but we can't record that. No, not going to be doing it? No, no, no I, th I think no one needs to see me uh, <laughs> dance to <with the> print. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll see if I can find it on Spotify because usually after I, uh, I lodge the podcast on, on my Instagram, I can share the song that the person, you know, that the guest has. So I usually try and find um, the song. So if I could find it, make sure you have a listen to it and get the office dancing again, I think, or maybe oh parla Parliament. They, Parliament they, they'll they'll disown me. That, they'll disown <laughs> me. They'll say, why couldn't you have picked up all these other songs that we've heard you playing? And I'm going, oh, at that moment, that was... Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's, just the, it's the one that popped up in my head. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh dear. Hey Sandy, thank you so much again. I think, as I said, I think you and I could actually talk a lot more, but um, that was a, a lovely chat, and um, I learned yeah. a lot more about you. And I think, um, I think, yeah, people that are listening will take something away from that from each part of it, really. So, I really, really oh. appreciate your time and for saying yes to step up to share your story today. You're very welcome. And you know, you didn't have to ask one question that I thought you would. You oh, know, I'll being go back. Don't you worry. I had oh, a few questions. Uh, if well, heaven sometimes. exists. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's what? right. You know, it's, it's always interesting, you know, politicians says, you know, that in that uh, construct about where we're going to head when we pass this, this next oh, realm. I shall ask. Don't you worry. Hold on. We will not finish. <laughs> if, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Um, that um, I'm actually early and can I come back later? <laughs> <laughs> it's not your time, honey. <laughs> That's right. You're early for your appointment. Get back, get in the line and we'll see you later. That's a, that's a very good answer. And I think that's a really good thing to end on then, okay? So. <laughs> and so now I'll make sure I'm not late to my, my business committee mm, meetings. So. And, so, and if you can't even remember the beat or tempo to that song, I think you're safe to walk into that meeting now. So. I hope so. It's, cause it's not a good look jogging along because it's serious business if I'm bopping none. <laughs> All right, so that's a pleasure. To you and also to your listeners and have a fantastic week. Yes, you too. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening today. I really appreciate you being here to listen to Sandy's story. Um, it went longer than one of our usual shows, but Sandy had a lot to share and she's got a lot of history and a lot of work that she has to do. So I respected that, that, you know, as usual, I don't have rules about how long these um, podcasts go for. And, you know, if it took two sessions for you to listen to the whole thing, that's fine. But I decided that we just keep on going with the flow because um, it was quite a comfortable chat and I enjoyed um, getting Sandy's time today. In terms of where this whole episode began when we were talking about living a more meaningful life or in other terms of living by your core values and understanding your gifts and talents and, you know, and defining what your purpose is, that's what I do every day with clients. So please don't hesitate to reach out if you're um, interested in doing any coaching. That's, again, that's me. I, I'm a life coach. I'm experienced and a member of the International Coaching Federation. And I have many years of business experience behind me, as well as more years than that in life experience. And, yeah, I would be, I'd love to have a chat with you on, on the website and oh, anywhere that you find this on social media. Uh, there's a, a book of clarity call and that's just a free call I offer to any person who just wants to have a chat and you know see whether coaching something that will help you move forward close the gap from where you are to where you want to be do that with a bit more joy a bit more um, pizzazz whatever there is there's all sorts of ways that you can move forward and you know it's been a tough year so if, if coaching can help you you know, get out of a funk and get you moving. Uh, that's what I'm here for. So thank you once again. And um, I hope you can join me on the next show. Thank you. Signing off, Sue Dunlop. Mm -hmm.